grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is our gospel reading from John chapter 2, which begins with these words, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, Amen. In the Star Trek universe, Montgomery Scott, chief engineer of the Enterprise, has a reputation of being a miracle worker. And one time he explains to another chief engineer how he got that reputation. He tells that other chief engineer that Starfleet captains are like children. They want everything right away, but what, you just need to give them what they need. For example, how long did you tell the captain it would take to repair this? One hour. How long will it really take? One hour. Oh, you didn't tell him the exact amount of time, did you? You should have told him four hours. Then you could do the work in one hour. How else will you become a miracle worker? So that was how Scotty did it. Padding the time it would take for him to accomplish a task so that the captain would be impressed. And, oh, Scotty, you're a miracle worker. Well, during the Epiphany season, over the next number of weeks, we are going to see Jesus revealing himself to the people of his day and, and to us as well. And today, Jesus reveals himself to be a miracle worker. It's the familiar story of Jesus at the wedding of Cana, and we're told that his mother tells him the wine has failed, they have no wine. And Jesus says something interesting. He says, woman, what's this got to do with me? He's not being disrespectful towards his mother, but he is distancing himself. As we consider this story, we might ask, what's the significance? What's the, what's the purpose for Jesus changing water into wine? Well, the obvious purpose is they've run out of wine. And for this young couple, beginning their married life together, inviting all of their friends and family and neighbors to come to their wedding feast, it would be quite the, the social embarrassment for them to have run out of wine. So, so Jesus, through this miracle, is, is saving them from that social embarrassment. But there's more to it than that. Even though Jesus seems reluctant at first to engage with this problem, what's this got to do with me? There's a reason why he does engage. In fact, there are a number of reasons. First of all, Jesus being at this wedding and saving the day, so to speak, gives affirmation to the fact that marriage and family are gifts from God. Jesus being there at that wedding, Jesus being there to celebrate with this young couple, to give them his blessing and to save them from that social embarrassment, is underscoring the fact that, that marriage is a good gift. And it was a good gift that was given, first of all, in the Garden of Eden when God the Father walked Eve down the aisle and brought her to Adam. And he saw her and recognized something in her as he said, This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And so we had the first 
marriage. And through the centuries and through the generations, the union of man and woman as husband and wife in a lifelong commitment has been the foundation for every civilized society. It is the, the basic unit around which society revolves, marriage and family. But Jesus' presence there at a wedding had even deeper significance. In our Old Testament reading, as Isaiah is talking about God and his people, he writes these words, For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Jesus is the bridegroom. His bride is the church. Jesus being there at that wedding in Cana, well, that wedding served as a foretaste of the great wedding and the great wedding banquet that will ensue in eternity when Jesus is joined for all eternity with his bride, the church, what we often refer to as the marriage feast of the Lamb. This wedding in Cana was a foreshadow. And Jesus, even though he was a guest at the wedding, he is the true bridegroom, the one who loves his bride, the church, and longs to be united with her for all eternity. So, they run out of wine. Mary brings it to Jesus' attention. Jesus kind of distances himself from her. But then, Mary in faith tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. Mary knows that her son will do something. And she prepares the servants for that. And then we see that Jesus tells the servants to fill these stone jars with water. Now there were six of these stone jars. They held 20 to 30 gallons of water each. And after they have filled them with the water, he tells them to draw water from one of them and take it to the master of ceremonies. And when the liquid is taken to the master of ceremonies, he takes a sip of it and he is amazed because this is the best wine that he's ever tasted. And he tells the bridegroom, normally you serve the good stuff first and after people have been drinking for a while their sense of taste isn't as as strong and then you serve the cheap stuff but you have saved the good wine the noble wine for last Jesus in turning that water into wine was making an announcement, was making a declaration. He was declaring that the age of the Messiah had arrived and that he was there to establish his messianic kingdom. Because in the Old Testament, the messianic kingdom, the kingdom of the Messiah, the Savior, is often equated with wine. Whether it's through the prophet Joel or Amos or Isaiah, Oftentimes, when there's talk of the kingdom, wine is referenced. Listen to these words from Isaiah chapter 25, beginning at verse 6, as God's kingdom is described. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. 
On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. So this kingdom where death will no longer exist is also described as this tremendous banquet of the best of meats and the finest of wines. Jesus, when he turned water into not just any old wine, but the best wine, and in abundance, he was announcing that he was the Messiah. He would be the one who would fulfill prophecies like this of Isaiah. The wedding banquet, the great banquet, would be all about him because he came as the Messiah. He came as the Savior. Changing water into wine was his announcement of his arrival as God's Messiah. So, this miracle of our Lord underscores that marriage and family are gifts from God because Jesus was giving his blessing upon this union of that young couple in Cana. The changing of water into wine was also an announcement that the messianic age had arrived, that Jesus was ushering in the messianic kingdom. There's one more thing about this miracle for us to take note. When Jesus kind of distances himself, himself from his mother, he not only says, what does this have to do with me? He also says, my hour has not yet come. When Jesus talks about his hour, it has significance. And he's saying here that whatever the significance of that hour is, now's not the time for it. But let's look 10 chapters deeper into John's gospel in John chapter 12, where Jesus says, now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. So at the wedding of Cana, it was not Jesus hour, but here in John chapter 12, it is. It is the hour of suffering. Because in John chapter 13, we have the Last Supper, followed by arrest and trial and execution and burial. That's what Jesus' hour is all about. But Jesus calls this the hour of his glory. Not the hour of his suffering, not the hour of his trial, the hour of his glory. And in fact, John tells us that at the end of this story. This, the first of Jesus' signs, he did at Cana in Galilee and manifested or made known his glory. The glory that was glimpsed here in Cana would be put on full display on Calvary because Jesus on the cross is Jesus in his glory. It is Jesus obedient to the Father. It is Jesus doing the greatest miracle. It's as if he's saying here in Cana, you think water into wine is impressive, wait till you see the Son of Man on the cross. Suffering and dying to pay for the sins of the world, redeeming all of humanity, making it possible for people to enter into that banquet, to go to that mountain where there, there is the feast 
of the best of meats and the finest of wines where death will be defeated for all eternity. Me on the cross, that's the miracle. As I offer my life to fulfill the words of John the baptizer who said of me, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Your sin. My sin. All those times when we, like the wine at this wedding, have failed. Those times when we have not fulfilled our calling as God's people. Jesus went to the cross so that we could be redeemed. And so we could be invited to his eternal banquet feast. Yes, that is the greatest miracle of our Lord. His suffering and death for our deliverance. Saving the day in a much greater manner than simply changing water into wine. Changing sinners into saints. That's Jesus, our miracle worker. Unlike Scotty, Jesus doesn't have to pad the numbers to get the reputation of being a miracle worker. He is the genuine miracle worker. The one who, yes, can change water into wine, but whose greatest miracle was changing us into God's children. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.